and it was weird like i almost had like a sense of loss yeah at the like the identity that i had assigned myself but also like a feeling of renewal because i was like oh no this is this fits me better and it's a complete match and the jigsaw clicked into place welcome to adh derp with stephen and herf ADH Derp, where whimsy meets focus with Stephen and Herve. Join us on a journey through the quirks and cur- curiosities of ADHD as we navigate the delightful chaos of our minds and explore the magic with the neurodiverse world. Strap in for laughs, insights, and a sprinkle of randomness as we embrace the unique adventures that come with ADHD. Episode 3, Stephen's Diagnosis Journey. My process was completely different to yours. Um, I always kind of knew that there was, like I, I kind of described it as a bit missing. <clears throat> um, there was something that didn't quite click. It was <clears throat> like a jigsaw piece just wasn't there. Um, and for years, it's funny you mentioned about autism. Um, there, for years I thought it was autism and I thought I was autistic because there's a quite strong vein of autism running through my family. There's several family members that have different varying degrees of autism. Um, So for years, I just kind of accepted that there was some sort of neurodiverse something um, and just kind of developed coping mechanism and just kind of dealt. Uh, I never really looked into any kind of formal diagnosis. And I think like when you say about the depression and when you were a teenager, you were going to do it and then just changed your mind yeah um it's similar to that i think i kind of decided against a formal diagnosis because like in my younger years because i was kind of afraid of them telling me that i was quote unquote normal yeah uh, that there wasn't anything like formal wrong with me and wrong is the wrong word but there wasn't any kind of neurodiversity yeah and i was just lazy or i just didn't have the same coping skills that other people had and that was just something i had to deal with so that kind of was something i just accepted that like there was something missing and i just had to deal with it then as i was i was in my 30s and approaching my 40s and we made the decision to expand our family Um, and as we were kind of doing that i decided that i needed to kind of take a bit more responsibility for what was going on um and there was a like many 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 factors in this decision but one of the main ones was that for all of my life i've had a fear of driving okay um anyone who kind of knows me will be very aware of that like graham my husband always had to be the main driver or when i did start to learn to drive in my 30s that it was a very stoppy starty not very focused process at all and i did everything in my power to get out of it and absolutely hated the whole process um and would like sometimes leave the car shaking with fear and just absolutely hated the whole thing um so i went to a gp and talked about that initially um and we i was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder or generalized anxiety disorder um and was medicated on that and that made a massive difference like huge it changed my life um after the loading dose process Mm. uh, which again something we'll talk about during the medication episode and but there was still like it fixed some things but it didn't click fully um so there were still some issues that were that i was noticing that again i just kind of accepted and just dealt with um, I'd gotten a diagnosis, so I was like, "That's that should be me done. Why am I not happy? Why am I? Why am I still having these these kind of these things?" So I was just kind of like, "Yeah, it, it's definitely autism. It's definitely autism." And there was one day, and I don't remember what the tipping point was, but I was in one room and Graham was in another room, and we were texting, and I said something to him about being autistic. And he sent me a screenshot of two lists of symptoms. So, it, sorry, I'll go back a little bit further. Yeah. People have said that I have ADHD 
for a long time, but I always just ignored it. And okay. said that it was, I've had friends who've said I've, I have ADHD for years right. and I always just kind of ignored it. Um, and said, no, it's autism. It's definitely autism. Autism's in the family. Um, so then Graham, I think he just got frustrated and he sent me a screenshot of two like lists of like, kind of like checklists. Okay. Yeah, one yeah. was autism and the other one was ADHD. And I was like, oh, I have none of this one. I have all of that. And one. did you know which list was which at this time? I, I did, okay. but it was, it was still kind of like, almost like a watershed moment where it was just like, oh, yeah. Oh, I've been saying this wrong. And it was weird. Like I almost had like a sense of loss. Yeah. At the, like the identity that I had assigned myself, but also like a feeling of renewal because I was like, oh no, this is, this fits me better. And it's a complete match and the jigsaw clicked into place. And yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, and that was, so at that point there was no, uh, there was no dealing with it. It was just like, yeah, no, I have to go and get a diagnosis. Okay, this is, yeah, this yeah. has to happen now because I need to formalize this so I can actually do something about it. <clears throat> Um, so I, we were at the tail end of the pandemic, the, the very tail end, it was 2023. Um, but I was still very much enjoying the idea of a remote diagnosis because I don't enjoy yeah. going to see people. Um, so I looked up what kind of psychiatry, first of all, how the process works, yeah. um, costs and, um, I completely disregarded the possibility of a public diagnosis. Yeah, I was the same as well. I was like, you know, uh, first of all, it was almost impossible to figure out how to go about it um, outside of, you know, kicking off the first step with with the GP. But also the waiting lists were just, you know, Waiting and ADHD just do not My God. play well together. Um, so I was lucky enough, and I know that it's like not everyone is in the position where they can uh, seek a private diagnosis yeah. and our mental health system really needs to change and put more funding into that side of things. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be able to explore a private uh, diagnosis. So I, I looked up all the different ones that were available uh, that were kind of like approved by our health system, the HSE. Yeah. Um, so I got in contact with uh, Dr. Martinez. He's based out of Barcelona, but um, he operates in Ireland. Okay. Um, I, I th- it's Dr. Jaime Martinez or Dr. Jamie Martinez. I'm not actually sure. Uh, I, ha- I always have that problem, <laughs> you know, with a Spanish Jamie. Yeah. Like, is, is, it, is it the other I, way? I think it's Who Jaime because it's spelled J-A-I-M-E. Yeah. Um, I think that's Jaime. Um, but Dr. Martinez. Yeah. Um, so I had a session with him and uh, we went through all of the diagnosis forms, the tests, which was quite a rigorous process. And, uh, Graham had to fill in forms. Uh, there was forms related to my childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, he did all the, ass- all the tests, um, and the scores and all that kind of stuff. And he was like, yep, you have ADHD. Um, not so much like you, you've got extreme, um, Cross type, basically. Extreme combined. Combined, that's the one. I'm I'm on both sides of the extremity. I have combined as well, but very much not on the hyperactivity side. Mine is Mm. very, very, very heavily leaning on the focus side. Yeah. uh, Or lack of focus, should I say. Um, We did discuss depression as well, which is, there does seem to be a correlation uh, there, but um, we we didn't talk about it in any kind of big way because we we decided that how my anxiety medication was treating that was was fine um and the other kind of the other thing he diagnosed me with is impulse control disorder mm. which is its own separate thing but okay. it's commonly associated with ADHD and will probably likely be its own episode as well um but he um he did that diagnosis uh, issued me the report um some like follow-up stuff, some uh, recommendations. We have follow-up appointments um, and we have a kind of like, we have we have uh, formal follow-ups scheduled, but we have informal kind of check-ins from a health perspective okay. uh, on a monthly basis before he'll issue the uh, prescription for the following month because they can affect blood pressure and stuff like that. So yeah, I have yeah. to record and measure my blood pressure. And you're pressure. obviously on medication for the anxiety disorder as well. Yeah, so exactly. You've got to be worried so about that. So we have to yeah. make sure that there is no no cross impact, basically. 
um, that's not the right correct word. You were talking about me using pharmalo- pharmacological. <laughs> terms and I really don't. It's like, no, uh, I don't know what the correct, correct terms are. And most of the terms we use here will probably be wrong <laughs> because we're both new at this. We're both kind of only finding our way and exploring. And uh, that's what this is all about. It's, and that's not podcasting you're talking about or drugs or yeah. ADHD. It's just English you're talking yeah. about. That's true, yeah. <laughs> we're like, <laughs> words. Um, but yeah, that that's my experience. It's been, uh, it when you factor out the the medication side of it, how the diagnosis itself has impacted my life and how, how that alone has changed things. Um, I think something that our respective speech um, <laughs> notice is probably something that we talk about this a lot more in their, like from their perspective. Yeah. And I don't think it's that we talk about it a lot more. I think it's just, first of all, that we have a name. Well, I mean, for how, jelly brain. Y- you don't talk about it more because you never talked about ADHD previously, yeah. you know, before the diagnosis. So, um, it's a completely new concept in yeah. this new world pre or post diagnosis. So yeah, of course we're talking about it more because it's it's a completely new thing. But uh, you continue on with what you're saying. You mean in terms of just general talking about these types of issues? Yeah, like talking about like factoring things through ADHD and yeah. what that means in terms of plan because we've always kind of planned things in certain ways. Um, we've got like even down to like the kind of micro level of like house chores yeah. and things like that and what that actually means because there has been ongoing arguments all through our entire relationship about like house chores keeping regular tasks done on a regular basis all yeah. that kind of stuff uh, and it was always kind of like, why can we not just do this? Why are we not just functional adults? Why are why can't I just bring the bin out when the bin's full? That's a really good point as well, you know, in terms of the relationship side as well. Yeah. Um, because you do look at other relationships and even like for, from my perspective, looking at you guys uh, from the outside, not knowing obviously the ADHD stuff and, and, uh, and other things, but, you know, you're, you're always looking at other people's relationships as a benchmark yeah you know when you all obviously you don't, you don't see what goes on behind closed doors but i think as w- especially for people in in our situation you know there is that kind of um that feeling of less than you know why 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 can't i give my wife or my husband the relationship or the the side of the relationship that they need yeah. and they deserve and uh you know having gone through so many years without the diagnosis, without having something to attribute those issues to, um, you know, cause all of those arguments. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry. And the the ar- like, in during those arguments, like, you're defending yourself, you're given rationalization, you're explaining reasons um, why you didn't bring the bins out. Yeah. Um, but your self-worth is what ends up getting thrown out with the bins. Because yeah. you're, like constantly going why can't i do this why, why yeah why didn't i do why it? am i not enough why why didn't i just get off my arse and bring the bins out why can't i just follow a list why can't like i have how many reminder apps <laughs> on my phone why don't i use those why don't i use like i've made lists why don't i follow the lists and it's like yeah in that moment when you get the report that basically confirms what you suspect it's like that's why yeah and that's like i've heard people talk about and this will be discussed during the medication episode, but I've heard people talk about when they get the diagnosis and when they go on medication, that there's a silence. Yeah. That didn't happen for me with medication, but it did happen for me with the diagnosis because well, okay. I was able to go, that's why. I was able to stop asking the question and blaming myself and beating myself up and going, why am I failing here? Why am I failing here? It's, Here's the reason. Yeah. But not as an excuse. Exactly. And yeah, that's yeah, the key yeah. part. A lot of people think that when you get a diagnosis like this, it's going to be an excuse. And you're going to use it as a reason to fail. And you're going to use it as a reason to not do the things. For me, it's completely the opposite. It's an explanation. Exactly, and yeah. It allows me to kind of work <clears throat> around and go, I know that's not going to work. So let's try something else. Let's try and build a different framework. In the same way with the medication. You try one thing, it doesn't work. With... With the diagnosis, it's completely changed how we approach those kind of, I suppose you'd consider them menial tasks of like yeah, 
hoovering the the house, bringing out rubbish, bringing out like shopping. Now I made some mistakes today, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, the like those kind of tasks, you, we've been able to approach them in a completely different way, and factor it in allow grain to do the parts that i can't do so it gives me the room to do the parts that i can yeah so uh yeah that's that's how the um diagnosis has affected my life and it's been fantastic yeah that was that was great and there's a few things that i wanted to kind of circle back on um to to introduce some corporate speak um <laughs> i'm out of the game so long now you know i need to oh, slip it's, it it's in gonna there. start coming back don't um, worry. so yeah just most recently there's the the, the arguments, mm-hmm. the conversations, um, the self-worth. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned, like, you're always on the defensive. And I, I figured this out before the ADHD diagnosis was that most of the arguments that we were having were due to either one of us being defensive in a kind of anticipation of what was to come, yeah. you know? So we weren't actually arguing about a problem. We were having a conversation about a problem yeah. and then one of us would get defensive about what we expected the other person to talk about or to feel. Yeah. And then that was what was spurring on the argument, which is just completely bonkers. And one of the biggest things that I realized was we're actually, we're in agreement all of the time, but we're just not able to articulate, um, you know, the situation from our perspective that's yeah. in agreement with our species or species uh perspective and uh, you know when it came to that realization the the level of arguments just completely fell off a cliff and this was pre-diagnosis yeah so the diagnosis has only helped you know to to mitigate those issues yeah um and we do still argue but rather than me taking it you know as the end of the relationship and pure divorce now it's just oh okay let's just well, we've had an argument let's move on with the rest of our day like, hold on a minute because that's something I didn't know um, and that's something that like I've never really discussed with anyone something that like and it's funny because it's kind of a benchmark that Graham uses for how successful the diagnosis and medication process has been that before I had a kind of habit of being quite dramatic in these arguments okay yeah. where like thrown the whole relationship out the window and like oh this isn't yeah. going to work it's like we're we're but clearly you, not suited and did you do that internally or externally no ex- externally like okay it's right. like this isn't like we're we're clearly not meant to be together or like i'm gonna pack up the car and leave yeah. and this is like he and grain it's gotten so cliche that <laughs> grains be like yeah okay sure whatever okay well just come back to me when you're like yeah when, when you've you come down, down off this yeah. <laughs> mad wound up tornado that you've gotten yourself so up interesting into. yeah and that is what has simmered right down and yeah that's yeah. it and so i didn't know that that's something that you also experienced but it sounds like yours was internal yeah but it's it's so interesting like to yeah. hear that from the other perspective now because yeah like what would happen in those circumstances for me would would be i would shut down and i just wouldn't be able to you know keep having a conversation yeah. and i just i just go into myself I'd stop talking, you know, Rachel would be like trying to have the conversation with me or whatever. And I just couldn't, I physically couldn't continue the conversation. Yeah. And all the while sitting in silence, you know, whether I stayed, whether I, there was one day I hopped out of a car on the dual carriageway just because I couldn't be in that situation anymore. Yeah, nice and safe. And yeah, now we were stopped, so it wasn't too bad. But um, yeah, and I, I would continuously be having this conversation, you know, and it would elevate and escalate in seriousness, the longer the silence went on, it'd be like, oh, maybe we should just, you know, have a break or maybe, you know, she's not, she's not, um, the right one. Maybe I'm not good enough for her. Maybe, you know, I should just move out, you know, maybe all the, all these maybes and, and, you know, it's the worst thing in the world. We're going to get divorced. We're going to break up. Who's going to take the kids? Uh, where am I going to live? You know, all these scenarios. How am I going to pay yeah. for rent? All this kind of stuff, like literally in the space of a five minute silence after a, after a ridiculous argument that didn't even need to happen um, in the first place. Yeah. So it's it's wild. It's really wild. I found out from Graham's side that like when he has these arguments, he says the thing that's in his head. No, no. And then it goes. Yeah. Well, the, 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 he, you're talking about the festering silence. Yeah. He just he just expresses it. 
And then it's gone. And even it, it's it's even more interesting because with the medication now, that that while it's simmered down, that doesn't it doesn't go away. No, like it's not a magic pill where my silence isn't filled with these things yeah. when we do have a serious argument. They're still there. They're just not as strong, and I'm I'm able to recognize you know yeah what's happening in my mind instead of you know going off that cliff. It's like I can pull yeah. myself back to reality and understand what's happening and why it's happening in my brain. You understand what those thoughts are, what they mean, and that they're not necessarily your internal dialogue. They're like a fear response or a fight or flight kind of yeah, response. Yeah. And you can characterize them for what they are and go, I'm going to come back to this later. You yeah. know? Uh, and like that's, that's the kind of tools that the diagnosis process really helps people manage you know that's uh, that, not that's the tools to manage that's the that's the kind of tools that you get equipped with and that's before you even look at the medication side that's just yeah. purely getting those questions answered and it's something like i think if people have these questions in their mind if they have like that question mark on do i ha is there something here don't like there there is there can be an inherent shame with looking this stuff up and yeah. questioning is there something quote unquote wrong with me because people who have ADHD aren't inherently wrong it 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 just something it's just something that is it's so a, a lot of the things you see now you know there's obviously been a lot of the de development around the research and the the thinking and the conversations around what ADHD is you know on true yeah. it used to be called ADD attention deficit yeah. disorder now it's ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and a, a, a lot of the research that's coming out now and the conversations that are happening now it kind of posit that it's not actually a deficit disorder. It's a surplus yeah. disorder. You know, there's too much focus. Yeah. There's too much hyperactivity. Um, I saw some research actually that um, I forgot because ADHD. Um, and I was reading, like it was kind of like a research paper. Because that's what I do in my spare time. I feel like that should be the, the new tagline of the, po the podcast. <laughs> because ADHD. Because ADHD. <laughs> yeah. um, that's not something I do in my spare time, by the way. That's, uh, <laughs> um, it, just, it was just something Is this in between looking up pharmaceutical dictionaries? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, oh, God, never go into my search history. Um, but, yeah, I was, saw this research that it was similar to that, that it's not a deficit, that it was a, like something our ancestors used kind of akin to a superpower that it was like a way like hyper focus and hyper fixation mm. were a way of protecting yourself that okay. if you could like over focus on things like even in terms of hunting and gathering you're able to last longer you're able to bring back more you're and you're able to protect your family in in that way so there was there was some research that it's it's tied to like evolutionary well better that's interesting and so you're the one who's out there hyper focused on hunting and gathering and protecting your family all the while i'm over here for three and a half hours trying to make a fire so we can stay a bit warm and my family's getting eaten behind me yep. but i'm so hyper fixated i can't even you know, turn around to check on them. But we're fine. I got yeah. my meat, you got your fire. Um, so, yeah, I... <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I think that if people have the questions of should they explore this, there's no harm. Like, people should absolutely yeah. um, check out what resources are available. And I think what we should do is um, in the descriptions for this video, I think we should... Um, list both our separate psychiatrists that yeah. we used because <clears throat> we both had positive experiences there and some other um, uh, some other resources like ADHD Ireland yeah. um, which are a fantastic resource um, places like that uh, there's some other ones um, but we'll list the ones yeah, like yeah. I mean we've ones. obviously come across a load in our journey so yeah. we'll pop them all down below or wherever it is um, and just uh, to bring it back to the, the shame thing um, you know, when you're having these conversations like I did with, you know, friends and colleagues and work and, and just listening to podcasts like this, where you're thinking to yourself, um, this, this resonates with me, you know, this is my life. People are yeah. explaining, you know, that's not, it's not a coincidence 
you know, it could be a coincidence. But realistically, if you've gotten to the point where, you know, you're 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 feeling people like us are talking about your life, go and do it. You yeah. know, even even take an online survey, even read some some of the the literature around it. You know, and and see if it kind of resonates even further with you, and be open about it. You know, I was very afraid at the start to even just say it to my wife, you know, and we have a very kind of open relationship in terms of conversation. We don't, don't have one of those ones um, oh, that I'm aware on that. of I'm anyway. I'm jumping on that later on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, th- like we talk about everything. We don't yeah. really hide much from each other and um, we don't have secrets. We've been like that kind of since very early on, but this was, you know, I had, I had a nervousness um in in bringing it up with her um and then even talking to the gp that kind of nervousness and like they're just gonna laugh at me they're gonna think i'm ridiculous yeah and even then on into you know how how do you go about it in your professional life obviously we're kind of out there now you know i mentioned it in in a linkedin post or two um a while back but i don't kind of advertise it an awful lot i do kind of think of myself as someone who advocates for mental health and th- and things like that but i don't advertise hey look i've got adhd it's not in my banner it's not it's not a tagline or anything like that but we're we're kind of opening up the door to that now with this yeah. podcast you know um which is it's terrifying you know especially as an unemployed man um who's who's kind of struggled for the last um few months trying to find something that fits um I'm putting this out there in advance of actually securing a new job. Yeah. Is that going to affect my, uh, my, my potential employers? Is it, is it going to reduce, you know, um, the, the pool of jobs that I'm, uh, effectively able to get into. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a worry. Um, but I think the only way to make that not a worry going forward is for people like us to be open about it, to yeah. share the stories. Yeah. We have ADHD. I've spent, you know, 15 years of my career succeeding, exceeding yeah. um, in, in, in many different circumstances. Um, and that kind of brings up one other thing um, that I, I don't know if it, if it comes up an awful lot, you know, in these conversations, but I think it, it kind of definitely resonates with me. And I think it does from an outside perspective with you and its resilience. You know, I think people who have ADHD have this kind of inbuilt excess of resilience you know we go through life with all of these issues and challenges yeah not understanding what they are or why they are but we get through them why do we get through them who knows you know (laughs) but we do we do get through them and you know for people like myself and yourself you know we've gone through school leaving cert college um courses whatever we've done we've both got beautiful families you know, we've both ha- have our own houses. You bought your house, I bought my house. We've since had family changes that have resulted in different uh, accommodation situations. All but, part of the crazy you know, few years you've had. These are these are all huge, big milestones that, you know, maybe people don't think from the outside yeah. that people with ADHD can accomplish. And that's a wrap on another episode of ADH Darecast. We hope you enjoyed diving into Stephen's diagnosis journey and the random tangents along the way. Remember, whether you're navigating the daily challenges or celebrating those ADHD wins, we're here to share the ride with you. Leave a note to let us know what you thought of our episode so far. We're learning from scratch as we go, so tell us what we're getting right and where we can improve. Let's keep the conversation going until next time. Until then, stay quirky, stay awesome, and keep embracing your unique ADHD journey. Take care, and we'll catch you in the next episode of ADHD Aircast, where we'll chat with our very first special guest about their own experiences with late diagnosis.